Okay, well, I think we'll we'll uh, start. I think it looks as if most people have um, have joined. A few, few more still coming in. So, uh, welcome everyone to this seminar. Uh, I'm Paul Eakins, and I'm a professor of resources and environmental policy here at UCL, and I direct the Institute for Sustainable Resources. Um, perhaps in terms of the context of this event, more uh, relevantly, I'm uh, uh, a co-chair of the advisory board of the Geo for Business program of the United Nations Environment Program. And uh, Geo stands for the Global Environment Outlook. And this is the uh, major assessment report that uh, UNEP, the UN Environment Program publishes roughly every five years, looking at the state of the global environment. Um, and the last version of this, Geo 6, the sixth edition was published in 2019 at the UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi. Um, and uh, UNEP then launched this process, which was really to ask the question, uh, given that uh, we are beset with environmental challenges of all kinds, and I became terribly aware of them during the production of Geo6, of which I was also a co-chair, uh, what should business be doing? How should business be responding? to the myriad environmental issues with which we're faced, um, uh, including obviously climate change, the crisis of nature and biodiversity, uh, pollution, uh, resource use, and all these other things. And um, the Geo for Business program, which UNEP set up to seek to answer that question across different issues, uh, will have six business briefs. Um, and we're very fortunate to have the one of the coordinating lead authors of the first of those business briefs, and so far only one has been published. Uh, that's Ben Tuxworth, and I'm going to hand over to him very soon. Um, the other five will be published over the course of this year, and they cover such topics as decarbonization, the circular economy, um, electricity networks, the food system, um, mobility, and the transport uh, futures. So uh, all of the big topics, really. And um, we hope with ISR to organize seminars like this around each of these once these business briefs have been published. I'm also engaged, going to engage in a little bit of commercial activity because in addition, um, we're utilizing this uh, sort of geo for business process to launch our own short course on uh, business and sustainability. Um, the first of these takes place in June um, and uh, we're being supported in that by Anthesis, which is the company that employs Ben, and he may tell us a little bit more about that in due course, um, uh, really to uh, start providing some uh, high quality education for business people who want to respond to this in their own businesses. And we've spent a bit of time putting the program together, as you would expect. And if any of you are interested in how that is uh, going to work out, please uh, email me. I'm very easy to contact. You've simply got to find me on the web um, and I can send you the flyer and, and uh, all the information that will give you, um, tell you how you can register for that. So uh, uh, I, I hope that's going to be a useful addition to our educational activities. Right, so that then brings us to the seminar for today. And um, I've uh, said a little bit about Ben. Ben uh, works for a company called Anthesis and uh, he is uh, a director of the Anthesis Group. Uh, this is a large company, a uh, global company giving sustainability advice. He has more than 30 years experience in strategy communications, leadership development and stakeholder engagement. And this is obviously why he was chosen by UNEP to be a coordinating lead author of this brief. Of, of this brief. Um, his clients include many of the world's leading companies in hospitality, tech, fast moving consumer goods, etc. cetera. Um, uh, he's been at Anthesis since 2014, so he's definitely got his legs under the desk there, but um, he, before that, led the consulting team uh, in sustainability communications at Salter Baxter and um, uh, was a decade at the nonprofit Forum for the Future as Director of Strategy and Director of Communications. Um, and that was where I was uh, fortunate to meet him because uh, I was one of the founders of Forum for the Future and we worked briefly together there. So it's been great to see how his career has uh, developed since then. So uh, I'll introduce our other two 
speakers in a minute uh, in detail, but just so that you know who you are seeing on your screen, we've got Rodolfo Lacey, who's head of uh, environment directorate at the OECD. And uh, before him, we're going to have Ray Newton-Smith, who's chief economist at the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry. So uh, that's who you've got. And um, without further ado from me, over to you, Ben, to tell us about uh, the Geo for Business brief number one. Thank you very much, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I've got uh, a handful of slides to, uh, to guide you through the next 20 minutes. I'm going to talk about uh, the briefing and, uh, and what we think it might mean for, for business. Um, hopefully you can see that. Uh, Paul, can you give me the nod that you're seeing that in some sort of full screen? Yes. OK, I think that's right. So, um, yes, thank you. Thanks for the intro, Paul. Um, as Paul says, I work for a, for a sustainability consulting group called Anthesis. We're, we're based mainly in the UK and North America, but kind of expanding rapidly into the rest of the world, um, about 600 of us. And I suppose the, the interesting thing about the current time and why this briefings focus on the kind of transition underway is so important is that we are growing now I think off the back of a real sea change in the way organizations and particularly businesses see the future and they are in this kind of paradoxical position of really beginning to understand that something very profound is changing in the way in which their businesses will need to operate and understand their supply chains and their consumers and their operating context but also having to live with uh, in, a, in a world kind of rather locked into a, a conventional model of progress based on resource exploitation and economic growth in a pattern which people understand can't continue but really struggle to escape from and, and I guess that that paradox is uh, the, the place where we spend a lot of our time now as consultants trying to support businesses on how they understand and respond to that um, and so the briefing um, that we're going to talk about today, I guess, is another contribution to helping companies and particularly perhaps some of the smaller companies that don't have the strategic capacity to really engage with uh, big picture agendas like system change and transformation and perhaps the policy, policy agenda, but, but still need to be part of, lean into and help drive this big transformation in a positive direction. So that's the kind of context for the brief. And I'm just going to take you through I guess a sort of run through what, what the briefing covers and some reflections that we had as a group of authors as we were producing it during the course of last year, which of course was the year in which COVID brought into sharp relief some of the challenges, but also some of the opportunities that come with disruption and the potential for, for much more profound and rapid change than we're used to expecting and seeing. So, um, Paul mentioned that the briefing that we've produced was very much about translating the findings of the 2019 Global Environmental Outlook 6 for business and helping companies understand what all of that means. And of course, um, as, as consultants working in this space, I guess we're sometimes somewhat reluctant to, to just keep bashing away with the, the, the really big bad news that we, that we see from the science around the environment and not just climate change, but biodiversity. But we would have been shirking our duties if we hadn't made the briefing uh, a clear um, a clear account of some of that profound uh, challenge and some of the, the sheer scale of the, the threat and the difficulties facing our, our development model and the way businesses function at the moment. So there are some of these challenges on screen. No doubt these are familiar to you. It, it still does surprise me that sometimes you can go into a boardroom of a company and find people who are somewhat reluctant to see the, the scale of some of this and to understand its implications, not just in the very long term, but in their, in their short term business planning now. But we certainly get the sense that these, these big challenges are very present now in supply chain risk, in consumer uh, mindsets and consumer behavior. So, so they really are coming into the, the decision making equation in a much more a much more uh, real and uh, immediate sense for a lot of business decision makers. Um, I think it's probably also worth mentioning that despite the fact that GEO6 is principally an environmental uh, report, if you like, and a set of observations about the changing environment, 
Geo6 itself and, and our author group and the briefing is in no doubt that these environmental challenges can, cannot be addressed in isolation from their social and economic implications. And that in fact, if we're to get to the other side of these problems uh, with, a, with an intact environment, we can only do so with a just transition, with a socially just uh, approach to it all. So um, I make no apology for focusing on some of the environmental stuff, but, but I think it's implicit throughout that we need to find a positive social path through it. And, and, that, and that again has been a really key debate in business over the last year as, as COVID and the response to it has dialed up the, the social dimensions of, of this, this transition. And also, uh, you know, we've seen quite interesting and important moves around uh, gender equality and racial equality, which have been driving business thinking over that period, perhaps in an even more uh, dramatic and dynamic way than has the, the level of environmental change. So um, those of you familiar with the kind of long debates about how we get ourselves out of this fix will know that the theory says we really need to decouple whatever we think human progress is in its, in its, in its health and well-being sense, in its economic development sense, from resource use and environmental impact. And so um, the briefing, this is an, an image from the briefing, it does talk about this whole challenge of, of, of decoupling, um, which is obviously a highly contested idea. Environmentalists and economists have been arguing about whether this is, whether and how this might be possible for at least 30 years to my knowledge and probably a lot longer. But the theory is there and we know that it has to happen. And I suppose what, what has changed for me in the debate uh, in business in the last well five five years at most but around that time is not is not the sense that this theory might be important but that we now really have no choice but to think in these terms about the future that this isn't a kind of arid academic debate about how we should proceed but has become a much more live question um, and that the transition uh, in which we come to some other method of achieving our human well-being uh, without environmental degradation is no longer a choice. We have to make that, that change in the, in the coming years and we have to do it much more rapidly than we've been able to in the years that this idea of, in, of decoupling has been discussed. Um, the big challenge, as I've kind of alluded to, is that in essence, many businesses are locked into the same economic system of environmental damage that we've seen um, for the last hundred years or so, um, we we were interested as we wrote the the briefing last year. I'm quite excited by the the possibility that that the response to COVID was seeing was also driving a rapid uh, decline in carbon emissions, for example. And we got quite excited about the the possibility that there might be a big environmental upside to COVID, um, uh, perhaps a silver lining. It was interesting to note in, uh, in August that Earth Overshoot Day, which if you're not familiar with the term, is the, the day on which a bunch of NGOs estimate that we've stopped using, um, we've gone past using what the Earth can replenish in a year and started to uh, uh, work down through the, the capital of our resources. It fell on the 22nd of August in 2020 which is only 24 days later than it fell in, in 2019, so you still see that we have a major problem, even if every year had the slower economic activity of a COVID year on our hands. So we're locked into these kind of pathways where positive changes and innovations are, are still offset by continued growth, these kind of rebound effects of material consumption and pollution. And that actually efficiency gains and optimization, which is what a lot of companies like to focus on when confronted with these difficulties, will not in themselves be enough that you know, in uh, improving the the, uh, the intensity of environmental uh, of resource use and environmental pollution of production will not in itself be enough chipping away at those things, given the sort of uh, very significant and rapid change we need to see in decarbonisation and uh, in uh, re reduction in resource use. So that's um, that's quite a profound challenge, and the brief spends a bit of time explaining and. Uh, trying to help readers understand the nature of these much more profound transitions when efficiency and optimization is no longer enough how they occur and, and what and how best to understand them. But suffice to say, moving out of these kind of locked in pathways requires deep transformative changes. But those transformations, those transitions 
are also underway. They are emerging all around us. And again, the brief spent a bit of time thinking about how these are beginning to emerge and how they, how they are changing uh, sectors, uh, systems, including energy, finance, food, circular economy, and so forth, and looking at how that kind of change uh, emerges and how, and how companies can respond to it. So again, not a new insight that, uh, that transitions happen. Uh, what's interesting is how an individual organization can respond to those transitions, uh, help steer them in a positive direction. And that's what uh, the rest of the brief kind of focuses on. And that's where I guess if there is a big idea in this briefing, it's that, uh, that we need a, a kind of new North Star for business. Um, and that idea is one of a nature positive economy. So this is a, a phrase that kind of has been coined in one or two places over the last year or so. The World Economic Forum is using it a bit. It's really this idea of understanding how uh, businesses and economic activity has to, has to exist within the envelope of uh, environmental limits. So, so again, building on earlier ideas such as planetary boundaries from Rockstrom and uh, donut economics and even the circular economy. So a number of ideas that use interlocking or concentric circles to talk about how we need to operate within environmental limits in the future and what that might mean. We tried to bring all those things together in a, in a kind of vision for that future of the nature positive economy and to use that and to encourage businesses to use that idea of whatever they do having to exist within limits and also make a contribution to human well-being and uh, the restoration of nature. So uh, quite a nice idea and perhaps a bit utopian. I think the interesting thing about, again, an idea like that is that whilst I've been looking at diagrams a little bit like that for perhaps 25 years, I think we're finally seeing really solid action in response to that kind of thinking from business and from government. Um, uh, so just a few examples here. We've seen, I think I looked yesterday, uh, over 1200 companies have now made commitments to the science-based target initiative. So that's about trying to bring carbon emissions in line with the climate science. So in line with those environmental limits over the next 20 to 30 years. And there's some examples there, Amazon, Microsoft, um, and so on, uh, setting more ambitious targets around bringing their emissions down to uh, net zero or better. We have companies like IKEA committing to full circularity uh, by or before 2030. And then you also see a lot of action by government. So uh, the figure I've seen, and this is a few months old, is that around 50% of global GDP is generated now by nations, regions or cities with an actual or intended net zero target. So that's quite a dramatic shift, in, at least in the intention of, of countries and, and regions and cities to, to achieve this kind of radical decarbonisation pathway and many countries now setting targets that are legally binding and, and more ambitious than, than a 2050 time horizon. Um, and you'll see some of the, the more specific policy uh, ideas that, that roll out from those, uh, those big binding targets in terms of uh, you know, the use of petrol and diesel cars. So I think all of this is highly encouraging, even if a lot of it is still about intentions and targets. And um, we see uh, the companies that we're working with setting these kind of targets but really grappling now with what does the roadmap look like to achieve those things and you know what does it mean for our supply chains for our products and services for our employees for our partnerships for the way we collaborate for the way we think about our conversation with consumers so i would say there's a level of seriousness about all that that's different uh, you know by an order of magnitude even in the last 18 months um, in terms of the way companies are thinking hard about these, these kinds of challenges and what they can do. And as I say, very different systems emerging in, in energy, in food, in finance, in the way we think about waste, which are there to, uh, to lean into and to be part of if companies can be, uh, can be uh, engaged in the future in a new way. Uh, so I'll end with just a, a few thoughts on what does it mean for a, for a company, perhaps a smaller company, to kind of understand this transition is underway and lean into it and the, the briefing kind of ends with a with a shopping list of of things that a company might think about doing uh, which is 
I think now quite familiar to bigger companies, but perhaps still still new. And certainly, we find a lot of a lot of smaller companies coming to us uh, wondering what, what the kind of steps are in, in getting to a situation where they are more likely to survive these five to ten years, and best of all, to really profit by being part of the transition. The first part is to understand the baseline, which sounds a bit dry, but to really understand the level of risk and the, the kinds of opportunities that may face you in your current situation and, and, and therefore where you are exposed and where you need to place your efforts. We are absolutely inundated at the moment with companies wanting to understand their scope one, two and three carbon emissions, for example, and, and it worries me in a way that there is a lack of capacity in our industry, in the sustainability consulting industry, if you like, to service that need for understanding and uh, transparency around that particular component of risk. And I think we will see a similar demand for services around exposure to biodiversity risk uh, um, as people get more hard edged about understanding that and, it's, and, and how their business relies on it. I think the next step is then to set um, a nature positive purpose and a strategy. And again, we've heard a lot about business purpose in the last decade. I think increasingly companies understand that they need to nest their commercial purpose and ambitions in what it means to be a company that exists within environmental limits um, and achieves and contributes to the restoration of nature and to human well-being. And part of that then, of course, is to be specific about the goals that you will set and to track and report progress on them. Then there's a bigger challenge of internalizing all that and really making it drive a business. And this idea of disruption with, from within, which is, uh, I think, something that lots of companies are, are kind of almost setting up um, separate ventures within themselves to disrupt the business and think differently about the future. We see this time and time again with companies who know that they are locked into a model that can't last, particularly obviously in the fossil fuel space. And trying to think about how they build a new kind of business and a new way of thinking about from the inside out. And a lot of that is about finding new partners and having new conversations, collaborating around new ideas. And of course, changing the definition of success. And in, in that rather specific sense, I mean, how are the leaders of those business, businesses motivated, remunerated, evaluated? And what do they see as, as the, 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 uh, the, uh, the point of their leadership and the, and the and how will they understand when they have succeeded. So a very quick canter through what the briefing says. I hope it gives you a sense of uh, the, the context for it and also the sense that we're trying to build a, uh, a, a briefing which sets out not just the challenges but also communicates the, the opportunity and the art of the possible for the many organisations that we know will need to be part of driving us towards a good outcome here rather than rolling over and having difficulties in the face of a very disruptive future. I will leave it there, but very happy to uh, take some questions or, or hear from the, the other contributors. Well, Ben, that's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. And um, uh, really, uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, all, always nice to hear that case presented. A um, couple of domestic things before we get into the uh, responses. Um, We've got to have plenty of time for questions, and we're hoping, therefore, that the questions are forming in your minds as you're listening to this. If you want to ask a question, please um, click on the chat um, button at the bottom of the screen and then um, uh, write in your question, and uh, I'll then either read it out uh, or I will ask you to uh, pose your question yourself. If you hear something that makes you feel I absolutely haven't got time to type it, I must come in immediately. Uh, well, do uh, raise your hand and uh, I will try to pick that up. There's quite a lot of us, which is nice. And so that may not be so easy, but um, I'll, I'd like to have an interactive discussion about these things if we possibly can. So I'm going to um, go over next to Rain Newton-Smith and uh, as I said uh, before, she's chief economist uh, at the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry. She provides business leaders with advice on the UK economic outlook and global risk. So quite a lot of same kind of stuff as, uh, as Ben does. Um, she was head of emerging markets at Oxford Economics and managed a large team of economists there and was the lead expert on China, which is something I didn't even know. 
and uh, is obviously very interesting and relevant for this discussion. And she may like to comment on uh, some of her insights on China. Before that, uh, she worked um, on international forecasts for the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England, uh, led a team with responsibility for developing a risk assessment framework for the UK financial system. And of course, we know that the Bank of England has been pretty important under the leadership of Mark Carney in the whole business of uh, trying to encourage companies to look at climate risks. Um, she went on secondment to the IMF, International Monetary Fund in Washington, DC, uh, and was an advisor there to the UK Executive Director, um, and uh, was honored by the World Economic Forum as a young global leader. Well, that's fantastic. So, Rain, um, over to you for some thoughts on what Ben has said and anything else that may come into your mind on the topic we're thinking about today. Uh, excellent. Uh, thanks so so much, Paul, and, and a pleasure uh, to be here. I'm going to hold on to that moniker of young for as long as I can, though I have to say the pandemic is, is what it particularly is that we see the vaccine roll out. Uh, and my husband's now had the vaccine, but I'm not old enough yet to get the vaccine. Uh, it's the only time I've sort of wished to be older uh, than I actually am, but I'm definitely going to hold on to that uh, young uh, moniker. Um, and look, hugely uh important to, to be here and, and it's a great report uh, Ben that you've sort of put uh, together and I think so much of what you said really sort of resonated uh, with me and I thought uh, maybe what I could do is just give some sort of reflections on where I think the wider business community is on, on these issues reflecting some of the conversations uh, we're having and and what I think is really interesting as the sort of chief economist at, at the CBI is you know I'm, I'm sort of responsible for talking to businesses across different sectors and regions uh, in the UK and yes it, you know it's certainly as the chief economist primarily there about the economic outlook but where I've seen is just so much interest more, more recently is uh, over the past few years I've also been leading our teams within the CBI uh, who have been focused on uh, energy and climate change and, and our wider environmental footprint and it's actually that transition to a low carbon economy where businesses really want to uh, get engaged in, in the conversation um, and I think uh, in fact, our, our Director General sort of articulated it, it now. I definitely feel that the, the push and the drive in, in some ways to, to move uh, along that carbon spectrum is definitely coming from the business community. Um, and, and I'm not to say, I, mean, I, I will be quite open, I think, where I still see there are some serious challenges. But I think, uh, you know, businesses really want to help make this transition to a low carbon uh, economy. And often what I find is they are pushing us as, you know, as an organization to, to work with government and really um, get established the policy frameworks we need to see uh, to, to deliver that. And, and I think it's, it's been interesting over the years since the, the pandemic where it might have been easy, I think, for companies to say, look, we're fighting for our own survival right now. And these issues around the wider environment and carbon emissions, you know, they're a nice to have, um, but we just don't have the finances or, or the wherewithal to, to address those issues. But I have to say that sort of sentiment has has undoubtedly been the exception and, and most companies it's I think galvanize them in terms of what they see as their their wider uh, purpose so um, it's probably helpful if I talk a little bit around where we are on sort of carbon emissions and and then think more about the um, uh, some of the work that you've been looking at there Ben around thinking about uh, biodiversity and the wider impact on on the environment because my sense is in the business community we are moving in that direction and there are some real leaders in this space um, but it's still further uh, down I think some of the businesses thinking and uh, I suppose I'd, I can go into a room of, of business leaders and, and talk quite confidently with them about reducing carbon emissions I think if I start saying now we really need to think about biodiversity it's interesting how the dynamic changes a bit because businesses aren't sure yet what that means directly for their own business plans and so and I feel that is coming but it's not quite sort of mainstream I think in business strategy and, and that's something we may want to, to come on uh, and discuss because I think I certainly share the passion I think from many in the audience and, and I think what we'll see from um, 
uh, from some in the academic community and, and, and what's in your paper, Ben, that we need to really think about that. But at the moment, it's definitely further down uh, the, the conversation. Um, and, and so I guess sort of starting with that, that reducing carbon emissions, I think now and, and obviously Paul and I worked together on, on that advisory group into the UK Committee on Climate Change uh, when we were advising around the, um, the costs and benefits of adopting the, the net zero target. So this is running back a, a few years before the government adopted that, that target. Um, and I think what we've seen now is is businesses really did you know and it was a huge effort it was not it was business leaders it was the cbi it was the other business organizations and the ngos uh who were backing the uk ccc's recommendation that the uk should adopt uh that target and now i think there's a real sense that we need to see that roadmap uh, across different sectors uh, in terms of how we reduce uh, carbon emissions, whether that's thinking about our homes, uh, transport, our energy use, of course, uh, and, and, um, and, and also thinking about, you know, some of the newer technologies around carbon capture usage um, and storage. Um, so I think that's what's happening with the sort of policy framework. And then what we're seeing happening within businesses themselves is definitely an increase in more and more businesses adopting a net zero uh, target. Um, and, and Ben, you sort of mentioned uh, some of that, that work. Um, uh, and so, and I think you can uh, definitely point to, to many uh, good examples. And one of the things that we at the CBI are doing is working with businesses on sharing some of the best practice around uh, adopting a net zero target. And we've been working with Deloitte, the Met Office, uh, and many other partners and have recently launched a, a platform called Goal 13, um, which, is a, which is essentially a way of sharing some of that best practice about what's, what businesses themselves are doing in terms of adopting uh, a credible plan to reduce their, their carbon uh, emissions. Uh, and I think it, it is this challenge you said, some of the larger companies are, are more aware of, of their own emissions and, and are starting to formulate plans, but it, we need to make that accessible for businesses of all sizes. Though I should say, actually, when you were talking about that, Ben, I did think there are also some very s small companies who are, are leaps ahead of some of these uh, larger companies too. You know, we, we obviously have members who have sprung up because of uh, you know, renewable energy or, or installing solar panels or, or retrofitting homes to make them uh, zero uh, carbon. So I think you definitely find it at both ends uh, of the spectrum. And actually, at one of our committees most re recently, we had some businesses sharing um, what they were doing around reducing their emissions and and I think that the more sophisticated uh, businesses have started to think, if you look at Microsoft, I think has, has a really interesting target because uh, part they've got some hard, um, a tangible ways in which they deliver it. So they have an internal carbon price within the company. Uh, and that's one way in which they're not just setting the target, but trying to drive uh, the behaviors uh, to, to address that. Um, uh, and I think others are even looking at how they remunerate uh, their senior leadership in terms of having some of those carbon uh, targets. Um, but I guess from, from there, Ben, I'll maybe come on to this wider issue about our impact on, on the environment. And, and again, I'll probably illustrate it thinking about where, what we see in the financial services community and what we see in, in, in sort of companies uh, more broadly. Um, and, and I think we can, we can see that uh, within the financial services community, we now have the task force on climate related disclosures. So, um, and, and the chancellor here has committed to, uh, you know, UK businesses across the whole economy will need to disclose their climate risks by 2025. Um, and I think actually financial services firms have been in that space for a while. Uh, but that is now coming up to the, the wider uh, economy. And we know that uh, actually, there's a, another way of looking at the task force on nature related disclosures. So trying to think not just about carbon emissions, but businesses impact on the environment, their water use, uh, biodiversity loss. And I think actually that piece is, is really, really uh, important. And, and I think we do need to see not just the disclosures, but it is having a, um, 
recognized way of, of measuring businesses' impact on uh, the wider environment. I think in the carbon space, we now have a, a kind of accepted, you know, taxonomy around scope one, scope two, and scope three uh, emissions. Uh, but we need to, to kind of create that uh, around uh, a way of measuring businesses' impact on, on the environment. Um, and that's where I think that the, the thinking really uh, needs to develop. And I think, Ben, as you articulated, there's so much in the sort of opportunity space. There's definitely businesses that have almost, um, you know, made their competitive advantage, if you like, around the sort of circular economy, recycled um, materials. And, and I know you, you talk in your, your report about the, the WEF's uh, circular accelerator program. I was sort of involved in, in some of the genesis of, of that, where we had the circular awards, trying to really recognize some of the companies that were leading edge in, in the sharing economy or in um, upcycling or recycling uh, materials or um, just looking at uh, a, a very circular model of, of of resourcing um, and my sense is we will still have those companies that are really at the forefront but I also do think we need to have clear um, uh, metrics and way of it, measuring businesses impact on the, on the environment and regulation uh, around that I do think you need that carrot and stick and showcasing some of those really world leading companies but I think unless we have the right sort of regulatory place underpinning it uh, we won't get the behavior change kind of across the whole system as as you were talking and I uh, about and I think here in the UK one area that is really important is the Office of Environmental uh, uh, Protection and that that whole space of, of us uh, measuring not just uh, our financial assets and our uh, what's on the sort of balance sheet of the government, but thinking about wider natural capital, I think needs to be in the forefront of public policy, but but also uh, within uh, businesses. Um, and I think we've got some really good e examples of that. We uh, recently, uh, we had a presentation by JLL, one of the big uh, property uh, companies, and, and they actually set themselves their own target and it, uh, it almost a renewed purpose, which is what if a real estate company could save the planet? So they were really trying to take that, that broader uh, that broader perspective. But I think even then, it, it's, it's amazing how when they then looked at their global carbon footprint, because they're leasing a lot of their buildings and their bit, actually, uh, it's really their scope three uh, emissions, which is 98% of their overall emissions. So it just shows how you need that whole ecosystem. And, and they're then setting out sort of clear targets and objectives around the buildings that they are building and making sure that they are all net zero. But I do think we still have quite a way to go to develop how we measure things in terms of the wider impact on the environment. And I certainly share uh, your optimism in terms of some great examples we've seen within the wider uh, business community, but I definitely have my eyes wide open around some of the, the challenges and I think we need to showcase some of the amazing innovations we've seen, but I do think we need to have the, the, the ground rules and the set of regulations um, uh, and, and businesses disclosing their impact on, on the wider environment to, to bring the whole sort of system change that I think we're all uh, looking for. So really interesting uh, uh, paper, Ben, and, and really look forward to uh, wider reflections and discussion. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, um, Rain. Lots and lots of food for thought there. Um, and uh, I've got lots of questions of my own. So I'm, if no one else puts anything in the chat, I'm not going to have any trouble at all. Um, asking all those, but uh, I'll uh, just mention again, very happy to take questions uh, after uh, Rodolfo has spoken, and uh, we'll then move on to Rodolfo. So Rodolfo Lacey um, is the uh, head of the Environment Directorate at, o at OECD, as I said. Um, he has a doctoral degree in environmental science and engineering from Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana in Mexico and a master's degree in urban studies and planning from uh, MIT in the US. And of course, um, uh, I come from the Bar School of the Built Environment in, um, in the UK, and I think we are probably numbers one and two in terms of the uh, urban and, and built environment schools sure. in the world. So um, MIT is a very nice uh, sister to have in that respect. Um, and a certificate 
in leadership on environment and sustainable development from El Colegio de Mexico. And I, I guess that was quite, quite early in uh, the, the, the profile of these sorts of issues there. Uh, Rodolfo has also been a politician, vice minister in environmental policy and planning at the Ministry of the Environment and Natural Resources of Mexico. So uh, he was uh, in post for six years there and uh, therefore had responsibility actually to uh, try to give, um, give substance to some of these ideas that we're talking about. Um, he was chief negotiator of uh, climate change uh, between COP19 and COP23 for Mexico. So been in those, uh, those very difficult meetings where the global community tries to thrash out some response to the climate issue um, and uh, was a member of the high level group of the Global Environment Outlook, which is uh, where we came across each other once or twice, and that was that was great. So, Rodolfo, um, uh, I'm not going to spend any more time on your CV, lengthy and eminent though it is, because I think people probably want to hear from you in person rather than from me. So, over to you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, well, and thank you also, uh, USL and UNEP, uh, for uh, inviting us uh, to this very interesting dialogue uh, uh, around the, the first uh, geo business uh, brief. I think that uh, before the, 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 the pandemic, we were thinking at the OECD uh, what kind of uh, transformative policies, economic instruments we have to implement in order to really unleash the trillions that we need and deploy the massively the technologies, the low carbon and resilient technologies that our economies, our, our population needs to, to really secure the future. And, and we were thinking, of course, uh, in, the, in, the, in the transformative areas uh, to align financial flows with the low emissions resilient infrastructure, but also with this now carbon neutrality uh, long-term uh, a goal or target that uh, many of our countries are now uh, ambition to reach in 2050. Uh, so uh, we, we propose to reset the whole financial system in line with this long-term climate risk and opportunities. And um, it's, 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 it's very easy to say, and now that we have the taxonomy, uh, at least uh, for the first time we have um, uh, in the European Union, a green taxonomy that can standardize the products of the financial system. Uh, we are thinking that it is necessary to change the regulations of this uh, financial system in order to, to really take the decisions in the boards and the councils of the central banks, of the uh, different financial institutions, multilateral banks, of course, for development. Uh, and uh, these disclosure elements that Ryan was talking about, the climate uh, and environment risk assessments are of course very necessary to, to really uh, have a comprehensive uh, 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 set of, of um, elements, components in the financial systems to unleash the trillions that we need. But that was before the pandemic. No, so we, we were thinking, okay, what, what are the triggers for a deep transformation? And the OECD is a, it's a policy reform house. Uh, what, what, what we have to propose in order to, to really uh, unleash the trillions, as I was saying. So uh, the pandemic happens. No? The pandemic is a huge change uh, uh, in our economies. Uh, it's uh, the second largest economic crisis uh, in the last uh, uh, 70 years, I think so. And um, while this pandemic is not uh, speeding up this build up and breakdown cycle that uh, <clears throat> Ben was explaining that is part of this uh, very uh, 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 useful report, you know, uh, this uh, policy brief. Uh, and and uh, let me, let me uh, now start uh, talking about the key, one of the key messages that uh, this brief includes, that is, uh, well, the, 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 best, uh, the best incentive you know, for transformation uh, is, is, is the survival uh, uh, field that uh, many companies, of course, are living and, and they are struggling to survive in this very moment and why uh, they are not switching from 
business as usual, not very friendly environmental uh, activities to these low carbon uh, possibilities that we are talking about. Well, what is happening? Why we are not seeing that? At the OECD, uh, we are tracking, of course, all the uh, green recovery packages. And I can say that uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the analysis shows that despite significant resources flowing towards environmental friendly measures, more or less 350 billion uh, in these recovery packages, uh, many of them called green recovery uh, uh, packages or, or stimulus packages, there is a misalignment between short-term measures and long-term climate uh, and environmental objectives. Uh, the net zero transition is not negotiable. Uh, and, and the sooner we really embark on this transition, uh, the more we stand to gain, really. Uh, but we are, we are not seeing that. Uh, the lessons of the crisis are clear. We need to rethink our economic models uh, but on this business as usual, put people at the center of this discussion and make our systems better prepared to address future crises that will be related, of course, with more environmental extreme weather events uh, or health uh, extreme events as the pandemic uh, that is, of course, related with the zoonosis that uh, are part of, of this biodiversity crisis that we are dealing with. So to do so, we, we need to, to, to get the policy and the pricing right. And that is the, perhaps a part of the main recommendations that we are doing right now, because there are great expectations for the future. And the report is very clear about that. There is an example here that let me quote because I will contrast this figure eight of the economic benefits from a, transform, a transition to circular economy, that is one of the paradigms before the pandemic, no? in the Netherlands. So they are expecting to, to have revenues of 7 billion euros uh, for the Dutch uh, economy and, and more than 50,000 jobs uh, to, to really um, enhance their economy. And today I was uh, in a Southeast Asia event and Indonesia presented a, a very interesting graph, also a summary of what they are looking for the near future. And they were saying, okay, if we are reducing 43%, uh, uh, almost 50% of our greenhouse gas emission by 2030, we can create 15.3 million, million additional jobs. It's an amazing, a, a humongous, uh, effect for Indonesia. Uh, and of course, they can reduce poverty, they can uh, eliminate or avoid 40,000 deaths. And uh, they are, of course, uh, uh, expecting a 6% per year uh, uh, increment or growth of the GDP uh, between 2019 and 2045. So, uh, these great expectations really uh, are based in this idea of uh, transforming uh, businesses because the billions or the trillions will not come from the governments, will come from the private sector doing business. If we have the projects, if we have the money, if we have the technology, what this uh, good equation is not happening. And, 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 and for us, well, there are some triggers indeed that uh, we have to put on the, on the table. So the, the first uh, trigger that uh, we are, of course, uh, looking uh, uh, always at the OECD is the correct price. So we need to put a price on pollution, not only greenhouse gases and carbon emissions, on pollution. So uh, this uh, zero paradigm uh, is more related with pollution and the responsibility we have, the business responsibility, uh, <clears throat> we have to uh, avoid, of course, the destruction of the planet. So in the OECD and G20 countries, around 70% of energy related emissions are untaxed. Moreover, the most polluting fuels, including, of course, uh, airplane fuels, but especially coal, are amongst the lowest taxed. Uh, energy tax and subsidies reform is key 
really to achieve the triple objectives of decarbonizing domestic revenue mobilization and access to affordable energy. Uh, Rain talk about this internal voluntary uh, carbon tax uh, uh, in Microsoft. This is a good example of what uh, companies, big companies can do, uh, but small companies, medium-sized companies, well, uh, cannot do the same. So what, what alternatives they have? Of course, uh, uh, the, the governments need to, 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 to change at least something that can, uh, are under their control and, and because the population is against taxes, politicians are against taxes. Uh, and well, you saw in Paris this movement of the Gilets Jaunes. So uh, we must uh, zero out fossil fuel sources, in my opinion, is the most relevant uh, policy that we have to um, uh, insist and implement uh, in our governments. Governments continue to spend billions of, of, of fossil fuel subsidies uh, and, and you saw it in the recovery packages uh, uh, with the OECD's latest estimates at uh, 178 billion in 2018 across 50 countries. And revenues for carbon pricing are less than 40, 42 or 43 billion. So uh, the, the, the order of magnitude uh, is, is relevant here, uh, but the order of magnitude between those green recovery and recovery practices is, is, is also relevant. So we are replicating uh, the same scheme before the pandemic that we were following, uh, uh, and that is destroying the planet. So we have to do really something. So, uh, and, and, and second, and just to finalize my, my, my participation, uh, we think that we need a, a, a system to prevent, in the case of uh, uh, businesses, greenwashing. Well, interest in environmental, social, and governance, ESG, investing and broader sustainable finance has rapidly increased in recent years. So uh, climate focus on ESG indices were less volatile and suffered lower outflows than non ESG peers in the last year, uh, even in the rocky uh, months of 2020. So that is very important. Uh, we have to have, we have to measure the, the way our uh, companies are behaving um, uh, and establish metrics that can really help us in uh, shape and reshape uh, the financial system uh, according with the new circumstances that we are in. Well, that's from my side. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Rodolfo. And that again uh, gives us lots, lots to think about and a really rich uh, discussion. I've spent a lot of my academic life, as I think you probably know, on the issue of environmental taxation and uh, going all the way back to the early 1990s. And uh, it's clear that politicians find it really difficult. Um, and uh, at fora like this and it's just about the only issue I think economists agree on um, is that we shouldn't be subsidizing fossil fuels and we should be taxing carbon. And yet uh, that uh, routinely doesn't happen. Um, OK, well, we, we've, we've got the odd question coming in. But before we um, just turn to our questions, I'd just like to ask all of you what the kind of questions I often get asked when when I'm um, thinking about these sorts of issues, especially with regard to business. A really big picture questions and they relate to this issue of that Ben uh, emphasized that this kind of incremental change which um, we see all around us is simply not enough and we need systemic transformation and this became very clear to me in the global environment outlook uh, it's been something that all of you have talked about you've used the word transformation um, and I mean there is a, a strong sentiment out there from some people but uh, actually capitalism can't cope with this and that uh, capitalism simply cannot uh, make the transformation that is necessary. And everywhere I look in kind of books, popular books about this subject, I hear things like, you know, capitalism is broken, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd just like you to speak a little bit about that uh, because obviously that's, uh, that's important. And, and I mean, I can think of uh, going one step further, the book by Naomi Klein on climate change, this changes everything. Um, she makes it quite explicit that she doesn't think capitalism is up to the job of addressing these really systemic challenges. 
And, and then the other thing I'm always asked, which is was actually the topic of my PhD, so I'm going to ask it to you, is um, how can we cope with these problems in a growing economy? Uh, ben talked about the rebound effect. Um, we can make these uh, efficiency improvements and we can make these changes and stuff, but then the economy grows and immediately undoes everything, all the benefits that we've had. Um, and so, again, mainly with academe, within academe, I think, there's something called the degrowth movement, which quite explicitly says that rich countries must uh, not seek any more to grow their economy and might even need to shrink their economy if we are to come back within planetary boundaries. So those are the two kind of big issues that uh, I always get taxed with when I'm talking about these issues. And I'd be really interested to know, um, you know, how you would respond to them, because um, you must also be asked these questions. So, so Ben, going to you first, when, when your companies say, you know, things about the end of capitalism and economic growth and all that, uh, how, how do you respond to them? Um, I suppose I respond by saying, well, what do I say? I'm not, I'm not an economist. I can't even define capitalism. Um, so I, I suppose the, the interesting thing about that is that probably if you were to say in a boardroom, this means the end of capitalism, um, and that's what you've got to contemplate first before you do anything, that's not particularly helpful. Um, and in fact, the new, whatever the new system is, it will emerge. And perhaps at the end, we will call it capitalism, even though it'll be something radically different to what we have at the moment. Um, in a way, I don't, I don't really care what we call it. I just think there will be very different rules. Um, that said, I suppose there are some people who want to man the barricades of defending capitalism, what a thought. Um, maybe that's kind of the rearguard action being fought by people like Trump. Um, it looks to me as if they will fail, not because they can't find enough people to uh, agree that capitalism needs defending, but simply because the propositions they have just don't stand up um, in, in, the, in the, the context of, uh, you know, business success, however that is defined. So, you know, where are these new jobs in coal? Where, are, where is the, you know, the support for, for dying industries? It all seems to be fading away quite rapidly. Now, I'm sure Rodolfo and Rain know a lot more than me about the institutional barriers to that change, but I think nevertheless, you know, we're seeing almost a kind of bottom-up revolution in how these things are going to be done and, and what it will mean for business. And, and, and as I say, whether we call that capitalism at the end of it is, uh, is another question. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting response. Rain, over to you uh, with these questions. Well, I, I think when, when, when people talk about capitalism, and, I, and I'll come on to say unfettered capitalism, but I, you do have to start with the question being, what is the alternative? Uh, and, and I suppose, I, I guess, it's, it, we're talking about some of the system change we need, and I think we do need to change what we value as metrics of success. I think that is hugely important, both in terms of public policy, but, but also within companies. Uh, but I think to sort of say, actually, we want a, a, a revolution at the same time. I think uh, if we mean changing an entire economic system, uh, I think actually we then create a bigger problem uh, for ourselves. And I think there are certain, we, you know, market mechanisms do help help with efficiency. You, uh, they can also lead to, you know, asset price, price bubbles and other distortions, but there are certain areas where they, they definitely help with that uh, efficiency. And I think we also have to sort of keep, um, you know, some of the basic principles around social choice and individual choice for, for individuals. But um, I think, do we need a role for government? Absolutely. Is there a role for regulation? Absolutely. Um, and, 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 and so I think that is, is really important to, to re remember. But I, I don't think I necessarily want us to, to, to sort of change the economic system in which we operate uh, in, entirely. Um, uh, I mean, I do agree, I think, with some of you who caught Mark Carney's wreath lectures around the concept of value and that if you put a price on everything, you can undermine uh, what we think of in terms of social uh, value. Um, uh, and, and I think we do need to think about when we're, what do I mean, what specific changes does that mean? Well, I think when we're talking about 
looking at cost benefit analysis in government when they're looking at projects. I think every project should have um, reducing carbon emissions as part of that. I think actually I would go further and say you need to look at their impact on the wider environment. Um, uh, and I think the, the challenge is sometimes there's a bit of a trade off between the two and I think there is a bit of a tension at the moment because we've adopted a net zero target which is absolutely the right thing to do what I don't want to see is some of the you know some of the wider protection around our environment those two things need to work together and I think the government is doing some good leadership on this in terms of the Das Gupta review looking at the economics of, of biodiversity I can think of work that we've done uh, more recently for the Clean Air Fund which is looking at um, uh, the uh, economic costs from higher air pollution and what that does for people's working lives. Uh, you know, so I think those sort of measures where we're taking a wider view of what is the things we value. And if we narrowly only value GDP, we will miss so much of what is important uh, for, for us as human beings as, as well as for the planet. So we need to be thinking about measures of well-being as measures of um, and including health within that as, as measures of, of success for economic uh, policy. And I think there is an analogous um, element to that at the firm level. And I think actually Colin Mayer, uh, who led this uh, review around the future of the corporation, actually had probably the best articulation of it, is that businesses should be in the business of solving the world's problems profitably. They do need to make uh, a profit. Um, but they also must not profit from making problems worse. Um, uh, you know, and how you get those definitions right is, is really difficult. But I think that being the sort of purpose of uh, is, is really uh, important. And I guess if I could say something controversial, and, and this is a personal perspective, um, not necessarily something I can get all CBI members to, to agree with. Um, I do think sometimes we need to have a more honest conversation around, you know, consumption and that, you know, over the broad, you know, the I, um, and while I am a big advocate of the circular economy and what can be done, I think it's actually very hard to come up with a business which is truly circular. Um, I think every, you know, things we produce do have an impact on the wider environment. So it's a little bit like over the medium term, everyone flying less uh, is probably a good thing. Um, and that sort of comes, you know, the concept that maybe consuming less material things, um, you know, per head at a certain point, uh, you know, is something we need to consider. So, um, but I do think just trying to make the problem too big and, and we need to get rid of capitalism and then these issues around the environment would go away, I think is a, is a false narrative. We only need to look at you know, the Soviet Union, if we want to put that up as a different economic system, uh, you know, there were definitely challenges around the environment that existed in uh, in that period of industrialization uh, as well. So I think it isn't just the economic system. It's about using market mechanisms appropriately, but being clear about what gets valued. Great. Thank you very much. I shall certainly remember uh, a number of those points from you and Ben uh, when I'm uh, faced with similar questions in the future. Rodolfo, um, uh, how, how would you respond to that? I mean, you, you, you've heard a bit about the, the price mechanism uh, from, from RAIN and from others, uh, the, need for, the need for regulation. Um, where, where, where are you on these massive issues of capitalism and growth? Well, uh, perhaps uh, you may know that uh, I, I was trained as capitalist by my father, but trained as a communist by the university and my colleagues no? uh, there. But, uh, uh, it, it's, it, when, when, when someone asked me about the, these kind of uh, paradigms that were very relevant uh, when I was young, um, I always think in, in, my, in, my, in my sons, let me, let me give you a very frank uh, response on, on that because they are not thinking in, in those terms. The, the, the new generation uh, has a, a lot of resources, information resources, of course, uh, they see the, the world in a different way. Uh, they, they have more of uh, uh, information, yes, uh, about the politics, but about technologies, about options for development. Um, and many of them, of course, are looking to 
uh, do something that is relevant for the society and, and the planet to, if, if they are here if, in Europe, in, in, in America, in, in Asia, or in, or, or in Africa. Uh, it is true that there are uh, humanitarian tragedies um, and those tragedies are hard to uh, solve uh, from uh, not only business as usual approaches, but also uh, from this uh, profitability thinking uh, uh, of uh, that is coming from the capitalism, but uh, we, we, we have to be responsible of, of the social consequences of, of uh, trying to grow uh, forever and ever. This uh, uh, new generation, climate generation, uh, that is saying that uh, it is impossible to have an infinite uh, growth uh, because the planet has some limits. It's true, I, as, as, as an environmental engineer, I can say that we can adjust or we need to adjust every time, uh, every moment uh, in our daily basis, uh, the, the, the things that we do according with those limits. Sometimes we see very clearly the limits and sometimes we do not think in the limits if we do not assume the responsibilities. The, this, this, this classic uh, discussion about externalities, environmental externalities, uh, and, and this uh, uh, right for, for many uh, huge companies that are not, of course, uh, assuming their externalities. Uh, let me be a little bit more diffuse in my, in my response because uh, I was hearing uh, Ryan Rain uh, talking about uh, uh, we need to fly uh, less. No? So in my opinion, the ultimate test of uh, of doing a green recovery will be uh, will be that no because we cannot return to the cheap tickets that we live before the pandemic. Uh, the, the, that's a, a really a huge irresponsibility from the society. Uh, traveling around the world without uh, assuming the the environmental consequences of those cheap tickets, uh, the, those cheap holidays that we were enjoying enjoying uh, massively. Uh, is 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 is, uh, is 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 a is a big issue. So, uh, if we see that the aviation industry uh, implements, for example, uh, an, an an early uh, Corsia scheme uh, to reduce and assume their responsibilities on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, if we see that uh, we uh, invest more in those technologies that are reducing not only the the flights, but also that are improving the airplanes or that are changing the fuels uh, in the aviation industry. Uh, we, will, we will see that our policies that we are proposing, the changes that we are, of course, uh, um, um, uh, expecting uh, are, are effective. So uh, those are key elements, key indicators uh, in the very near future to see if the society is changing and behaving different. At, at the end, that is, in my opinion, the, the, the change that we are waiting uh, from our generation, of course, but for the new generations. We, we need a behavioral change. And this behavioral change must be uh, uh, responsible with the planet, uh, with other well-beings, uh, I mean, uh, with, with other uh, uh, people, societies, uh, more inclusive, for, for sure. And, um, and we have to promote those behavioral changes that are uh, neutral uh, in terms of uh, 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 possible damages for the planet or possible damages for the society in general, the, the planetary society. I think that uh, these behavioral changes are, are, are or will be part of, of our lives uh, uh, but because uh, we are living a new normal and this new normal uh, uh, will not return to the previous uh, pandemic life that we used to have. Okay, well, thanks very much to Rodolfo for that. Um, we've got a number of questions here, which I'm keen to, uh, keen to get. They've, they've suddenly all started coming in. So the basis of what you were saying. Um, and... Uh, uh, so perhaps we won't all answer all the questions because otherwise we won't get through them all. There are a couple of questions here about the um, 
uh, the, the, the need for law regulation and fiscal change, and you've all mentioned that to some extent, um, uh, versus uh, the need for education and, and other things. And that's from Andrew Edkins. And um, I'll give him a chance just to verbalize that if he wants to. And I'd like to take that one with the question from Nick Hughes about how big a change do we need in regulation and incentives to um, actually get things, uh, get things going um, I mean, does it still need a massive push or um, is, is there now sufficient interest uh, and awareness around there for, for, for these things more or less to take off by themselves? So, um, uh, Andrew, do you, do you want to add to how I've, uh, how, how I've interpreted your question or, or are you quite happy for that to be addressed uh, by, by the speakers? Um, hi. Uh um, Paul and uh, panelists, a, a great event. Um, I guess the, the question that I've got is it, it really builds off what Rodolfo said at, towards the end, which was that, yes, we need the, you know, the answer to my question is we need both. There's a great deal of uh, resentment to, to, to fiddle around with laws, regulations and, and fat fiscal um, sticks, as, as we heard. But one of the things that I'm curious about is, the, is this issue of time scales, because the, the point about changing laws, regulations and, and the um, tax regimes is that they can have quite an immediate impact, whereas education and behavioural change just takes a lot longer. So I'm, I'm now curious about the prioritisation as, as to whether you think that we have the time to educate and change the behaviours in the way that we obviously need to versus the... Um, blunt but fairly immediate impact that, that um, rules and laws and uh, tax measures can can make uh, happen quite quickly. So I'm, I'm just curious as to what people will think about the prioritisation. Thank you. It's you or me, but you're breaking up uh, in my um, thing. So it, it may well be me, Andrew, but thanks very much. Um, I'm going to ask the speakers to hang on while I ask Nick uh, Nick, do you want to verbalise your own question um, in in terms of uh, how 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 bigger incentive do we need? Um, sure. Uh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, it was just um, you know from a business point of view, are they currently hamstrung by the way the system is currently set up, and that we need to fundamentally change those and set those regulations and incentives to sort of change the rules of the game for businesses? Or have we seen a change over the last few years where consumers are actually demanding this stuff and it's quite open, the, the, the road is really open for businesses to go and develop quite really interesting new and radically new sustainable products because now there is a real consumer demand for this stuff. So in a sense that the, is it the case in that sense that businesses can actually run ahead of the regulation? Um, and, and be innovative sort of straight away? Or, or do we need the, the, the strong regulation to change their incentives? Okay, two, two nice questions there, um, which you might like just to address briefly if you could, because we've got uh, lots of other questions coming in now also on interesting topics. So let me start with you, Rain, this time. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll sort of try and take those uh, together and maybe almost wrap up in this idea another sort of question about do we need carrots and, and sticks and I think the reality is is we need both I think uh, Nick to your question I think there is definitely in some areas there that the innovation is is happening naturally there is consumer demand for more sustainable products that is driving uh, innovation it's driving new products uh, you can see that in in renewable energy as as well um, but I think in some areas it's more difficult so one example is around sort of passenger vehicles and the move to low uh, low emission vehicles I actually think that transition is is going to be I say relatively because I still think it's not straightforward uh, relatively easier than than some other areas like decarbonizing the way we heat our homes uh, because actually some of the electric vehicles on the market uh, for smaller passenger vehicles are nicer cars. And let's be honest, no one's really going to miss filling. Well, maybe people do like gas stations, but no one's really going to miss uh, petrol fumes and, and, you know, filling up at a petrol station. Uh, if you have a, a nicer vehicle that is 
uh, less noisy and and a more pleasant to to drive uh, and it's and the cost is uh, efficient then then i think is uh, is cost effective i think that will come naturally though actually there are some areas of passenger transport where we do need that and actually i think having clear for businesses having clear deadlines like actually by this date we will no longer you know petrol vehicles are, are no longer uh, allowed and and the same we've seen with sort of gas boilers having a target date for when we need to move away from that I think does help to, to drive uh, the change uh, that we need to see but I think we have to admit that in in decarbonizing the way we heat our homes that's going to need to take more intervention because it's costly uh, consumers don't know what the alternatives are um, uh, and there are distributional uh, effects that we absolutely need to, to consider um, uh, so, and, and I think we also need to see the regulation in terms of having more information uh, for consumers around what's, you know, you know, and I, I heard one scientist talk quite compellingly, you know, we have a traffic light system for our products in terms of uh, sugar content, uh, we should have more information that is very transparent around the environmental impact of, of how those goods are, are produced. And I think unless we have that information, and that is a regulatory change, uh, then it's very hard for consumers to make informed choices. Thanks, Rain. Rodolfo. Um, uh, well, I, I used to be for almost uh, 25 years, the environment regulator of the automobile industry in Mexico. And I believe in regulation. <laughs> Why? Because after the boom that we live in the last 20 years, uh, the technological boom that we live um, on the, in the energy sector, in the transportation sector, in the communication sector, now we are putting some regulations because the, the, the standards, the norms, uh, the limits included right now in our environmental acts in the environmental laws uh, are not stringent uh, are really uh, uh, permitting uh, the pollution uh, in, in many media in many uh, ecosystems uh, and of course without addressing the whole spectrum of new chemicals uh, uh, devices that are polluting or destroyed the planet so we need to regulate them uh, it's hard to say it, but uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is a fact. And there are, uh, of course, for example, new principles to, that we release at the OECD um, to, or, or for the use of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, why? Because uh, it's, 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 it's a new technology that is, uh, is not uh, harnessed or is not controlled. Um, there are some, of course, uh, uh, negative uses of, of this uh, of, uh, uses of this kind of technology. I think that it, it is the same with many other um, uh, technologies that are part of the solution, but uh, could be very harmful for the environment. Uh, the the that we saw, for example, for the nuclear uh, industry. Uh, uh, kill that option for the greenhouse gas control uh, in, in this uh, new pathway that we are defining for carbon neutrality uh, by 2050. So uh, we have to uh, uh, retrofit part of the regulation and we have to add new regulations. Uh, if, 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 if you ask me, as, as, as uh, Andy was saying, was asked, uh, yes, uh, questioning, uh, what is the priority? Uh, do we have to put more emphasis on regulation or more emphasis in education? Well, well uh, my answer is at this very moment, we have to regulate some specific activities that are really uh, destroying the future of the next generation. And that is, that is clear uh, for sure. Uh, we were thinking of causing, for example, carbon capture and storage, uh, or all these new uh, removal technologies that are available, but are expensive, but we have to deploy those technologies to really control not only greenhouse gases, but also short-lived climate pollutants. Without a regulation, it will be impossible to pass a tax uh, to control those emissions from those industries. And I'm talking about heavy industries, all kinds of heavy industries, uh, iron and steel, cement, of course, uh, 
uh, power plants, uh, mining. Uh, there are many heavy industries that without regulations, they will not have never uh, the, the, the right carbon pricing to really implement those solutions. And they will not leave the market. I mean, they will not uh, leave the business uh, for free. The, the, the lock-in uh, investments that we are seeing right now in the recovery packages need to be controlled by those technologies that will remove the emissions that are created by the recovery packages. So regulation is a must, in my opinion, in the near term. Thanks. Right. Well, the uh, emphasis there was pretty clear. Ben, what, what, uh, what, what are your thoughts when you talk to businesses? Um, well, I mean, I think it's right that we need we need um, carrots and sticks. I'm a great fan of the, uh, the what I once heard referred to as the carrot shaped stick. So the idea that you can kind of dress up an incentive in something that uh, also has a backstop, which is rather more um, uh, rather more uh, um, coercive. I think it may be a function of working mostly in a space where uh, it's the companies that want to be on the front foot with all of this stuff that come to that come to us for advice. We 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 don't often spend a lot of time uh, dealing with the threat of regulation as a, a driver of, of kind of more sustainable behaviour by companies, if you like. But that's not to say that it isn't important in kind of giving people that roadmap they need for how fast things have to happen and a clear sense that there is a, a material kind of risk they need to be aware of in a, in a meaningful time frame. I think one place where I would like to see uh, clarity um, because it, it drives so much of, of corporate behavior is better regulation around disclosure on uh, sustainability kind of KPIs and performance. Um, at the moment, the landscape of, of disclosure is, is just a dreadful mess and, and companies really struggle to engage with it. Again, particularly smaller companies confronted by you know, 20 or 30 different frameworks that they might engage with and wondering really where the, the benefit will be in doing so. So some clarity driven by regulation around that space seems to be kind of, uh, I, think that, I think that is kind of underway, although there's still a lot of complexity out there, but I think that would help a lot. I think beyond that, um, we're seeing so much action now driven by a sort of bigger picture understanding of, of the, the drivers and the future operating environment. And I think uh, consumer uh, and, and also um, supply chain sort of risk is, is, a, is driving a lot of that thinking. And that seems to me to be a bigger, a bigger incentive to change behavior at the moment than is regulation. Okay, right. Thank you very much. Really thoughtful responses. Um, we've got uh, precisely six minutes left and we're going to finish at uh, two o'clock GMT wherever anywhere else uh, is in the world. I'd, li I'd like speakers to address two last questions um, really. One uh, passionate question from Francisco Diego who clearly feels very strongly about the environmental destruction that's going on around the world. Um, uh, thousands of acres of rainforest being destroyed, associated ecocide, um, in order to feed our economy, how to stop it, how to stop it now, um, that sense of, of urgency. And I think all of us are uh, reeling at the, the news that the Amazon has probably become a carbon source over the last five years, rather than being a carbon sink, which is what uh, we've always thought it would be. So just some thoughts on that. I mean, you know, there's a real emergency out there. Um, and, um, uh, you know, what, what can be done about that? And then just picking up something that um, uh, Rodolfo said um, from an anonymous uh, attendee. Um, uh, in fact, two, two comments there. One was about carbon offsets. I mean, you mentioned the Corsia plans uh, from um, about aviation, Rodolfo. Um, UCL academic Simon Lewis had a, an article in The Guardian recently about the dangers of this carbon offsetting stuff and how little of it is actually additional and how easy it is to game the system such that we get a very dynamic carbon market, but actually carbon emissions globally keep on going up. So, so what needs to happen for these offsets actually to mean something? We're all familiar with it, 
with the flights that we take and we have an option to pay five pounds and um, British Airways will go off and do something useful with it, so it says. But, but I mean, to what extent is that really um, a, a, a useful thing? And then perhaps one final thought also from our anonymous SND, or I'm not sure if it's the same one, um, the whole distributional issue. Um, you know, 1% of the, um, the world's population actually consuming the majority of the world's resources. And I guess that probably includes all of us on this panel. Um, and uh, what, what do we do about that? I mean, again, a personal thing. I remember um, uh, one of my previous universities, I came in one morning and found a little note uh, from one of my senior colleagues on my computer saying, Paul, what are we going to do about inequality? And this was at the end of the 1990s, and we're now a little more than 20 years later. Um, I, I didn't have, uh, you know, a soundbite answer to that question then, and clearly this is still a huge, huge issue. So we've got three big questions. Perhaps you'd like each to take one of them, um, and uh, then we'll see whether that takes us to the end of our time. So, um, Rodolfo, you to start. Choose from the three questions. Okay, uh, perhaps I will select the offset question because uh, if you see uh, the emission inventories of developed countries and some developing countries that are including removals, you will see that the removals are mainly constant. So we need to increase, of course, the removals from, from, uh, from forest activities uh, uh, reforestation activities are part of this uh, big uh, market of offsets that are feeding, of course, the necessities, for example, of carbon markets, especially in the European market. So uh, COSIA will, will be part of, is the first international carbon market of offsets uh, scheme uh, before the uh, before the IDMAT scheme or market that we are expecting uh, when we finish the Paris Agreement rule book, um, that is a quite complicated task for the COP26. Uh, what, what I am trying to say is that uh, it, is, uh, it is necessary to have for developing countries, uh, first, we need to measure that but because they are not measuring that, uh, first uh, to estimate the removals uh, below the zero line of all emission inventories, because uh, carbon balance is, 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 is related with that. So the equation must include the emissions minus the, the removals. And in our uh, NDCs, in many uh, biennial reports, we are not uh, including those removals, but it's, it's not a rocket science. We do not have enough land to plant trees and remove all the emissions that our industrial transportation activities services are, are doing. So uh, we have to remove the CO2 that we are emitting or we have to capture those CO2 emissions or and remove CO2, perhaps greenhouse gases, uh, other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. If we really want a, a balanced situation or a net zero carbon uh, reality in 2050. So we, we have to start working on that. So uh, uh, we, we need to create the conditions to really promote the removals. Offset is one of the options, of course, uh, carbon bonds, green bonds. There are many other uh, instruments that can help uh, but also uh, we need to deploy the technologies, as I was saying, that will give us the opportunity to balance our emissions inventories uh, and prove that we are in the right track. So uh, all these kind of systems are, uh, uh, are not perfect. Uh, we are improving different carbon markets, different, different uh, offset uh, schemes. And that is, that is the challenge, so. Okay, uh, right, thanks, Rodolfo. So let's look to COP26 to try to make some progress on that. Um, and uh, Rain, your choice next of the two that remain. 
Uh, well, I, I, I'm just going to give some uh, some very just quick re reflections. A am I seriously worried about biodiversity loss? A absolutely. So I don't know. I probably can't give a good, but but I, I do think I am seriously concerned ab about the speed of, of action. Um, so, so what can we do about it? For me, it's about having a standardized way, to Ben's point, about being able to measure businesses' impact on the wider environment. For me, that is... Uh, critical because I do think knowledge is power and I also want us to move away from not just looking at risk because even within climate the disclosures is all around risk to thinking about impact uh, and even when we move to looking at a task force around nature if it's just about risk I think we do need to look at impact so people know what is the measurable impact on the environment I think only if we have that information can individuals firms and governments uh, make the right decisions. Great, thank you very much. Ben, that leaves you with um, the distributional one, and you did mention the importance of the just transition right at the beginning of your talk. I did, I did. Uh, um, perhaps you can just come back to that and, and that will wrap us up. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, absolutely, that it, it, you know, we need to address this issue, uh, and if we don't, we will not achieve the transition in environmental terms. I think there's no question of that. I don't have much. Uh, dazzling fresh insight on it except to say I would I think again I see in the companies that we work with just a much stronger and consistent focus on on diversity on equality on inclusiveness and these kinds of social agendas in the goals that they are setting and a lot of that is driven by the sustainable development goals which are predominantly social goals so whilst I'm not saying that will suddenly uh, put the world to rights I think I think there is much more focus on achieving those social aims than there has been in business. And I'm, I'm encouraged by that. And I hope that we will see that yielding uh, greater equality globally, not just, not just in, our, in our own country. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. A nice, uh, nice sort of hopeful, if not entirely optimistic thought uh, going forward. And uh, thank you to everyone who's attended. And uh, thank you above all to our three speakers for a really, really thought provoking um, time. Uh, just mention again, we're going to have more seminars like this, uh, focusing on the other Geo for Business briefs uh, when, when they're published. Um, and uh, UCL is going to be uh, conducting short courses to, um, I, I think Rain said at one point, or, or Ben said at one point, that, that there were not, not, enough, um, uh, not enough capacity building in business, really, to, to help executives address these sorts of agendas. So we're going to add our small, uh, our small bit to that. Uh, sometime over over the next few months. Thank you all very much indeed, and um, have a very good rest of the day or night, depending on where you happen to be located. So cheerio. Bye-bye. Thank right. you. Bye -bye. Thanks so much. Thank Bye. You. Bye. -bye.